I'd like to welcome you to this installment of our 2023 Winter Lecture Series. I'm John Hoptak. Uh, today, of course, is Saturday, February 11th, 2023, the day before the big day, right? <laughs> Looking out, I see some green attire, right? So how many is excited for tomorrow? Yeah. All right. I could imagine folks today are spending their time getting their snacks and uh, party trays together, their beverages, and how many of you plan to call in uh, sick on Monday? <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, uh, you know, a lot of partying, a lot of celebrating, because tomorrow, of course, for those who don't know, tomorrow is Abraham Lincoln's birthday, right? <laughs> and that's, that's what we were talking about, right? There's also a game tomorrow, right? <laughs> so just as a quick poll, who here is polling for Philadelphia? How about Kansas City? There's some, you see, this is what bravery looks like. <laughs> now, how many will not be watching the game? All right. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, again, uh, thank you so much for coming out on this beautiful winter day here. Again, I'm John Hoptak, and this is uh, a lecture on Nick Biddle and the First Defenders. So uh, our chief of interpretation, Chris Gwynn, uh, did not have a set theme for this year's lecture. Sometimes we do. Uh, but this year he said he wants us to focus in on the human aspect of the war and to tell some stories that are not often told. Uh, so I was happy when he approved this topic because, you know, despite the thousands and thousands of books that have been written about this four-year-long conflict, there are still some undertold stories. And uh, that, I think, is where Nick Biddle falls and the story of the first defenders. So just by way of brief introduction, okay, who were the first defenders and who was Nicholas Nick Biddle? Well, the first defenders was the name given to the very first northern volunteers who arrived in Washington uh, after the outbreak of the Civil War, okay? So there were about 500 of them composing the ranks of five Pennsylvania militia companies. They came from the cities of Allentown, Lewistown, Reading, and Pottsville. Uh, and these 500 volunteer soldiers in those five militia companies, they reached Washington, D.C. on the evening of Thursday, April 18th, 1861. So this is six days after the war's opening shots at Fort Sumter, five days after the capitulation or surrender of Sumter, and three days after Abraham Lincoln's call to arms. Okay, so those first five companies organized companies of Northern volunteers to reach the national capital in April of 1861. Now, as they made their way south, on their journey south to Washington, they were attacked in Baltimore, okay? There was a large crowd, a large mob of about 2,500 who were determined to resist the march of these Pennsylvania volunteers through their city. And at one point, they picked up bottles and stones and bricks and they began to hurl them toward these Pennsylvania volunteers. And there were a number of injuries that day, April 18th. But many who were there claimed that the very first person to be injured was not a soldier. Instead, it was an elderly African-American man named Nicholas Biddle. Nicholas Biddle, he could see on the screen, was traveling with one of those Pottsville companies on their way south to Washington. He could not, of course, be a soldier, okay? At that point, African-American men were not legally uh, allowed to enlist. And his age also may have precluded him from enlisting. We don't quite know how old he was, but most say he was about 65 years old when he was attacked. He was struck in the face with a piece of brick. Apparently, the wound was deep enough to expose bone, and he would go on to claim that he was the very first person to shed blood in the American Civil War, okay? So despite this kind of distinguished place in Civil War history, the story of the first defenders and Nick Biddle, they're kind of overshadowed, okay? It wasn't long before their story kind of got pushed aside or relegated to those footnotes of history. Um, so today, that's why I want to tell the story. And I want you all to be part of the story as well. 
uh, which is why upon your arrival here, I ask that you each pick up an envelope. Uh, let me just explain what they are. Uh, on the outside of the envelope is a name of one of those 500 first offenders, along with the company to which he belonged. Okay, so please don't open yet. We're gonna discover in a little bit what became of your particular soldier during the war. And I'm not forgetting the folks at home who are tuning in. Uh, in the description to the video below, whether you're watching live or later on YouTube, I was able to find the birth dates of 96 of these first offenders. I have them all listed there, and perhaps if you share a birthday with one of them, you might wanna look into his story a little bit. There's some links there that help you explore and find out exactly what happened to your soldier. So trying to engage not only the in-person audience, but our virtual audience as well. So thank you for watching. All right, so, oh, well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> much. Now, this story that I'm about to tell, the story of your particular soldier, is one that uh, is great personal interest of mine, okay? You see, that's me, <laughs> and that's where I grew up, okay? I grew up in Schuylkill County, Pennsylvania, about two hours from here, and a few miles south of the county seat of Pottsville. And from as young as I can remember, there's proof, I have just been captivated by this era in American history, the Civil War. There was something about it that drew me in early, and my parents who are here, they would always take my sister and I to battlefields, and we would explore these places, and, and I would go home with bags of toy soldiers and coloring books, and when we weren't at battlefields, well, we were exploring local graveyards. And this continued, of course, after I got my license, started to drive and wonder why I had difficulties, you know, getting dates in high school. <laughs> <laughs> but even still to this day, uh, whenever I visit home, I will stop at a local cemetery or try to, uh, just to pay my respects. This was a way for me to try to get to know the Civil War history of my home area. Uh, and I encourage everybody to do this. I mean, there's a, a lot of history to be learned from these old cemeteries. And there are some noteworthy graves up in Schuylkill County. There's a couple generals buried, and if you're familiar with the Gettysburg Campaign, and I'm assuming most of you are, <laughs> uh, up, uh, up on the top left is the grave of Jacob Frick. Now, he was the man who ordered the burning of the Columbia Wrightsville Bridge on June 28th of 1863. And if we fast forward one year after Gettysburg, the Battle of Petersburg, the digging of the mine of 48th Pennsylvania, that's the mastermind of that, Henry Pleasance. So they're all buried up there in my home county, and they're all still there. I just went this past weekend. <laughs> but one grave in particular, one grave in particular has always, always captured me more than others, and that's this one right here. Okay, this is the grave of Nicholas Nick Biddle. It's in the Bethel AME Cemetery in Pottsville. And as you can see, right there carved upon his headstone, first to shed blood in Civil War. Nicholas Biddle, Captain Wren's orderly. Now he was not traveling as a soldier. Instead, he was traveling with an officer as an aide in orderly, okay? So as a young kid, when I saw this, I thought, wow, the very first person to shed blood in the Civil War came from the same place I did, right? Schuylkill County. Now, I went home and I looked in my books, that golden book of the Civil War and the Time Life series, and I couldn't find anything, nothing about Nick Biddle, no mention at all. But wait, he was the first one, the first person to shed blood. Surely, we have to know about this guy. So a trip up to the Pottsville Library or the Historical Society and I discovered his story and I found out that he was wounded while with the first defenders. So I went back to those books, first defenders, nothing, <laughs> nothing. See the story of Biddle, the story of the first defenders, not often told, not well known. I was a bit disappointed, you know, even today kind of out in that Civil War world where we all live, you know, there, Nick Biddle is a familiar name but maybe we don't know much about him as we should, okay? Instead, when you ask people, what was the first unit to reach Washington? Who were the first soldiers to shed blood? Oftentimes you hear this. 
the 6th Massachusetts. Raise your hand if you know the story of the 6th Massachusetts Infantry. Absolutely. For those unfamiliar, on April 19, 1861, the 6th Massachusetts Regiment did the same thing the Pennsylvanians did 24 hours earlier. They marched through Baltimore on their way south to Washington. But this time, the mob in Baltimore was bigger. This time, the violence was more pronounced. This time, there was gunfire, and this time, there were fatalities. Four Massachusetts soldiers were killed, and at least 12 residents of Baltimore killed on April 19, 1861, the day after the Pennsylvanians marched through Baltimore. Okay, so really quickly, the story of those Pennsylvanians is pushed aside because of the drama of this and the outrage in the North of what happened when these Massachusetts men were attacked. I mean, look at all these lithographs that was done to, de to depict that scene. Guess how many lithographs I found of the Pennsylvanians? <laughs> None. <laughs> None. Uh, so it's easy to see why the story of the, of the first defenders kind of was forgotten early on because of what happened the next day in the same place, probably with many of the same people, uh, the fatalities, and of course, that date, <laughs> four score and six years earlier on that day, the opening shots of the Revolutionary War, okay, Massachusetts. Many of these Massachusetts men were from that same area, Lexington, Concord, so of course, uh, the press and the politicians, and you know, they all made a big deal out of this attack in Baltimore on April 19th, okay? But it must be mentioned that when the battered and bruised 6th Massachusetts Infantry finally arrived in Washington, they were greeted by whom? Those Pennsylvanians who had done this the day before, okay? And my, my boss, uh, Chris Gwynn, he was up there, but now he left, too bad, because I always like to remind him of this. You see, he's from Massachusetts. He's rightly proud of the 6th Massachusetts. <clears throat> but I like to remind him that the Pennsylvanians were there first, right? <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, he has let me proceed uh, with this topic. <laughs> All right. Now, the war clouds were gathering for many, many years, right? Especially after Abraham Lincoln was elected, there were war clouds of civil war gathering over the country. But still, still, those opening shots on Fort Sumter, they fell like a thunderclap across the North. There was outrage. There was shock, indignation, followed by a profound patriotic impulse, a determination to fight to defend the flag, to defend the country that was just fired upon by these South Carolinians April 12th of 1861. A patriotic fervor swept the North. Tens of thousands of young men rushed off to fight. Henry Royer of Pottsville, he captured that moment, okay, when he spoke about the reaction in the North to Fort Sumter when he said, when the illusion and madness begotten by the barbarism of slavery assailed our union with its armed hosts fired upon Fort Sumter and trailed in the dust the flag of their country, liberty-loving men everywhere stood aghast. The forces of rebellion had indeed been gathering and preparations for overt acts of hostility had been in progress for several months, but it had been fondly hoped fondly hoped and that believed that reason would resume its sway or that some responsive chord of the better nature might yet be touched and that our glorious union would be spared. The blow, therefore, came with undiminished force. Men at first were dazed. They stood speechless with blanched faces, incredulous that brothers of their own lineage could be guilty of so dastardly an act. But doubt and indecision were quickly dispelled. Relentless war had begun. News of the attack on Sumter was soon followed by a proclamation from recently inaugurated President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. He's now calling for volunteers to que uh, quell this now hostile rebellion of Southern states. Now, Abraham Lincoln, we see him pictured here. That photograph was taken on May 16th of 1861. 
He had been sworn into office only 40 days earlier, 40 days before Sumter, and he now found himself faced with the greatest crisis to yet befall this young republic. Now, Congress was not in session, and of course, Congress and Congress alone can raise and financially support an army. But yet, a law passed in 1795, it gave the commander-in-chief, the president, the power to call upon state militias. Now, militias, of course, were called up to usually protect their states, but in this case, they would be federalized. Okay, so Lincoln puts out a call to arms. He needs 75,000 men to serve a three-month period, 90 days, okay? And he needs them quickly. The response to Abraham Lincoln's call was pronounced, and it was fast, and it was electric. From Maine to Minnesota and all points in between, communities mobilized, and volunteers began making their way toward the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. And that, that is where they were most needed, okay? Following the attack on Sumter, there was a strong belief that the next place to be attacked would be where? Washington itself, okay? The government buildings, the capital city, there was a very real and grave danger to Washington. Many believed that a Confederate force was on its way. As soon as Fort Sumter surrendered, they thought Pierre Beauregard would be leading his Confederate force north in order to attack the capital. And those fears were especially pronounced when word of Virginia secession began to trickle into the capital, okay? What if Confederate forces put artillery on Arlington Heights? What if Confederate gunboats began sailing up the Potomac River? Washington, D.C., the capital, woefully unprepared for its defense. Washington, surrounded by slave territory, right? Washington, a lot of the residents, of Confederate sympathies, okay? Said one journalist, from the 15th to the 25th of April, the nation held its breath in anxious suspense. All eyes were upon the Capitol, with enemies within and advancing armies without. The fearful trembled for its safety. And truly, it seemed that Washington was doomed to fall. Many believed it would be attacked Verena Davis First Lady of the Confederacy, she sent out invitations to a few of her friends to join her and her husband, Jefferson Davis, in the White House on May 1st of 1861, okay? There was this very real, palpable fear for the protection of Washington. And in Washington was a force of only 900 U.S. regular army soldiers. So yes, there was a military presence, 900 soldiers, commanded by Winfield Scott, okay? And there was also a militia, a militia of about 1,500 persons. Okay, so Washington, D.C. had a militia, but many, well, they were, you know, questioning the loyalties of many in that group, okay? So that is kind of the military force that was in the Capitol when Fort Sumter fell. There were some politicians, though, in Washington Congress not in session, but there were still politicians about, and they began to raise a force, okay? So Cassius Clay of Kentucky, he raised 100 volunteers to defend the area between the Capitol and the White House, okay? And Senator James Lane of Kansas, he gathered together a crew of about 50 people. They called them the Frontier Guard, and they went into the White House, okay? They patrolled the White House, but that was about it, okay? That was about the size of the defenders in Washington, so all eyes are focused north, okay? The call goes out for volunteers. When will they start to arrive? What will happen first? Will the northern volunteers arrive in Washington, or will the city be attacked by Confederates, okay? A lot of tense, anxious moments in those days following Sumter. Now, the first five companies that would become the first defenders well, here they are, okay? They were the National Light Infantry of Pottsville, organized 1831, the Washington Artillery of Pottsville, 1842, the Ringgold Light Artillery in Reading, 1850, the Logan Guards, Lewistown, 1858, and the Allen Infantry of Allentown, 1859. 
These were all volunteer militia companies from these towns. Many of them have a history that went back decades, okay? And the communities were proud of these companies. There was a lot of pride in these militia units. Uh, the Washington Artillery, by the way, served in the Mexican-American War as Company B of the 1st Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry. However, no Mexican War volunteers were with this company when the Civil War began. But still, a long history, distinguished history for many of these companies, okay? Uh, a Berks County historian, when talking about the Ringgold Light Artillery, would say that this company was composed of good material, was well drilled, and was the pride of the city of Reading. Okay? Now, early in 1861, see, did I miss a slide? Yeah, here we go. These are the commanders, by the way, of those companies. Okay, so James McKnight, Edmund McDonald, John Selheimer, Thomas Yeager, James Wren, these were the commanders of those units <coughs> when the Civil War began. And they took this business seriously, okay? They drilled their companies. They regularly paraded their companies. They had regular drill uh, in their cities. Uh, and again, as those war clouds are building, okay, as the nation's drifting toward civil war, the governor of Pennsylvania, Andrew Curtin, he called upon some of the state military leaders to identify those units, those militia companies that were in a good position to respond just in case, okay, just in case. So they began to identify these units. And in January of 1861, a Pennsylvania militia general visited James McKnight in Reading, paid a visit to him, and uh, as McKnight later said, quote, my orders were so imperative in their nature and admitted of so little delay that I immediately set about perfecting and equipping my command for active duty. So they're preparing, they're getting ready, they're filling up their roles, they're marching, practicing just in case just in case. The Washington Artillery was there when Andrew Curtin was inaugurated governor in 1861 in January. They claimed later that they made the offer then and there, so they said they were the first company to offer their services. The National Light Infantry, however, well, they all met on the evening of April 11th in Pottsville, and they knew something was coming. So on April 11th, only hours before those shots at Sumter, hundreds and hundreds of miles away, the officers of the National Light Infantry telegrammed Governor Curtin of Pennsylvania and Secretary of War Simon Cameron telling them that they were ready to move. Whenever they were called for, they were ready to go. When that telegram arrived in the War Department, Sumter had already begun. Simon Cameron, the Secretary of War, received it, and he would later write, <clears throat> wow, he must have been in a hurry. <laughs> Simon Cameron, Lincoln's first Secretary of War, would later say the Pottsville National Light Infantry was the first company of volunteers whose services were offered for the defense of the Capitol, and with four other companies from Pennsylvania, were the first troops to reach the seat of government at the beginning of the War of the Rebellion. Okay. And this was a big deal to the National Light Infantry, to the veterans, because after the war ended, there was debate amongst the companies. Who was the first of the first? <laughs> well, the National Light Infantry, they proudly produced this document from Simon Cameron, right here. We were the first. We were the first. All right, so after Fort Sumter, all these companies are told, report immediately to Harrisburg. Make your way as quickly as possible. Leave your weapons, leave your cannons behind, which they did. Most left their uniforms behind. We're gonna give you weapons, we're gonna give you uniforms as soon as you arrive in Harrisburg. So, by the evening of April 16th, the Reading Company is in Harrisburg. And that is what the Reading Company responded to when the National Light Infantry produced that document. Well, you may have been the first to telegraph the War Department, but who was the first in Harrisburg? We were the first in Harrisburg. And it got more intense from there, literally. Who was the first to step off the train in Baltimore? That argument would come later. 
But the Redding Company arrived in Harrisburg April 16th. April 17th, here come the rest of these four companies, okay? The company from Lewistown and Redding and Pottsville, the two from Pottsville, arrived also in Harrisburg on April 17th. And all of these communities, they sent off these volunteers with tremendous pride. There were parades, there were celebrations, and it was quite cold in mid-April of 1861 in Pennsylvania. There was snow covering the ground. All these newspaper reports talk about how bitterly cold and raw it was when these trainloads of volunteers left Pottsville, left Lewistown, left Allentown, made their way. Snow covered the streets of Hamilton Street in Allentown, but that didn't stop thousands from turning out to wave goodbye, to wave their handkerchief, and bid farewell to the Allen Infantry. And each member of the Allen Infantry was given a $5 banknote from a bank in Allentown, which they quickly discovered was useless outside of Allentown, right? <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't really use it anywhere else, but still, it's the thought that counts. <laughs> Despite the seriousness of this occasion, okay, war had begun. The company historian of the Allen Infantry he wrote, most of the volunteers regarded the journey as a pleasant change from daily occupation. It was a picnic, an agreeable visit to the capital. Only a very few, more serious, realized that it was the beginning of war with its horrors, cruelties, and privations. So by April 17th, just two days after Lincoln's call to arm was announced, these five companies are gathering in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania's capital. And with the Washington artillery was this man, Nicholas Nick Biddle. So who was Nick Biddle? The simple truth of the matter is, prior to April of 1861, we know very little about this man. Of his early life, we have no record that's how his obituary began, two days after his death in 1876. We do not know where he was born. We don't know when he was born. At first, obituaries claimed that he was 90 years old. By the 1890s, when people talked about Nick Biddle, they said, no, he was born about 1796. So that would have made him about 65 years old in 1861. Where was he born? Well, the Pottsville Miners Journal said, we think he was born in Delaware. We think he was born in Delaware. Again, in the 1890s, the first kind of attempt at a biography of Biddle, a very small one, it said that he had seen enough of slavery in his early days to hate it. So he may have been born enslaved, may have been born enslaved in Delaware, around 1796, okay? The record is, again, unclear. How does he end up in Pottsville? How does he end up in cold country, Schuylkill County, Pennsylvania? We don't know. Many believe he escaped along the Underground Railroad, okay? Rebelled against slavery, made his way north to freedom. Others say he went to Philadelphia first. And in Philadelphia, he started to work for Nicholas Biddle, the president of the Second Bank of the United States, very wealthy banker. And many believe that Nicholas Biddle took Nicholas Biddle's name because he worked for him. Well, I got in touch with the people at Nicholas Biddle's estate, Andalusia, near Philadelphia. They have no record of this. And they tell me that all the descendants of Nicholas Biddle are amateur historians and genealogists. They keep great records. And if there was a connection between this Nick Biddle and that Nick Biddle, they surely would know about it by now. That's what they told me. Some believe that he escaped slavery, went to Philadelphia, found work with Nicholas Biddle, and in 1842, Nicholas Biddle, the bank president, went to Pottsville for a big meeting, okay? And they went to the Mountain House. And when Nick Biddle, the President of the United States, left, Nick Biddle, this man, stayed. That's one theory. The other theory is Nick Biddle made his way directly to Pottsville and was working as a porter at the Mountain House when this Nick Biddle arrived. 
and there was something about him that impressed him so much that he adopted his name. Those are the, those are the stories that have been told over the years about Nick Biddle, this Nick Biddle. We don't know much. We don't know much, okay? But what we do know is that he was, when he arrived in Harrisburg, April 17th of 1861, he was wearing the uniform of the Washington Artillery Company. Even though he was not officially a member, he couldn't, of course, because of the color of his skin. But we do know that by the 1850s, he was in Pottsville. He was associated with the Washington Artillery. There's an account written by James Wren who said that when they fired their cannon, they had one six pound brass cannon, they had target practice in Pottsville, they had a 10 foot square piece of wood that they would try to hit with their cannon. After they had their firing practice, Nick Biddle, Nick Biddle would carry that target at the head of the parade in Pottsville. He was considered a part of this company, which is why he went. Now consider that brave moment when this man, who may have, who likely, was born enslaved, decided to go back south into a slave state, right? So Nick Biddle is with the Washington Artillery when they arrive in Harrisburg, April 17th, 1861. And the next morning, all 500 of those first defenders, they're awake early. This is the fateful day, Thursday, April 18th, okay? That morning, they're awake early. Captain Yeager of the, of the Allen Infantry was shaken awake at 1.30 a.m. Get your men up. We have to go. So he did. And then they waited. And waited some more from about 2 a.m. to about 8 a.m. But still, they were perfectly ready. <laughs> By 8 o'clock, all five of these companies have gathered here at the train station of the Northern Central Railroad, and they were mustered into federal service. They have become soldiers now, not of the state of Pennsylvania, militia, but now United States soldiers when they raised their right hand and took the oath of allegiance that was administered by Captain Seneca Simmons of the 7th United States Infantry, okay? So now they are soldiers, but they hardly looked the part. Some of them, some of them were in uniform, okay? Nick Biddle was wearing the uniform of the Washington Artillery, and they were largely unarmed. The officers had their sidearms, their swords and pistols. The Allen Infantry had their flintlock muskets, which had neither flints nor locks. But, said one person, they could be used as clubs, right? The best armed among these 500 were 34 members of the Logan Guards of Lewistown that carried modern Springfield rifles. But that was about it. Out of uniform, a motley assortment, right, civilian garb. Some of them had weapons, most did not, but they are now U.S. soldiers. They weren't really concerned about the fact that they were unarmed. They were not quite expecting any trouble. All we gotta do, get on the train, make our way to Baltimore, get off the train, go to another train, and go to Washington, right? It's an agreeable picnic to the Capitol. That's what one of them said. And besides, they're gonna have some help because also leaving that morning is about 40 soldiers of the 4th United States Artillery, professionals. They were assigned from Carlisle to go to Fort McHenry in Baltimore. And since you guys are going to Fort McHenry in Baltimore, come along with these Pennsylvania volunteers, okay? By the way, the commander of that 40-person contingent was this guy. Who's him, anyone know? Yeah. This is John C. Pemberton, who would very quickly resign his commission in the U.S. Army and join the Confederacy. And of course, two years later, it was this John Pemberton who surrendered to United, or uh, not United States Grant, Ulysses Grant at Vicksburg, at Vicksburg. Okay, so there was no direct line connecting Harrisburg. Let's see, where are we? Here's Harrisburg. This is where they got on the train of the Northern Central Railroad. 42 cars they filled up, and they began to travel south along the line, past York, Pennsylvania, through Hanover, Pennsylvania, 
across the Mason-Dixon line and into Maryland. There is no direct line from Harrisburg to Washington, which means they have to go to Baltimore first. Okay? And the Northern Central Railroad line terminated just north of Baltimore at a place called Bolton Station. So that was stop one on their journey south toward Washington, D.C. Okay? So they make their way, heading south, and not anticipating any trouble. As they made their way through Pennsylvania, there were people with U.S. flags waving them along the route. But as soon as they crossed that Mason-Dixon line, well, the sympathies changed. One of the first defenders said that he saw one of the students at the Lutherville Seminary, female academy, waving a Confederate flag at the train as it passed. Their first hint that some trouble may lay ahead. There was much trouble ahead because Baltimore. Baltimore, well, there's a lot of Confederate sympathy in the city of Baltimore, okay? There's trouble brewing. There were calls for secession in Maryland. There were calls for secession in Baltimore. And Civil War historian Alan Nevins called Baltimore, quote, a powder tub ready for a match. That powder tub was on its way, those 500 Pennsylvanians heading in response to Abraham Lincoln's call. Baltimore had a reputation for unruliness, okay? Some called it the mob city. There apparently were riots in Baltimore on election day in 1856 and 1857 and 1858 and 1859. And of course, there was that whole conspiracy about kidnapping and assassinating Abraham Lincoln as he made his way to Washington for his inauguration in Baltimore. Okay, so Baltimore has a bit of a reputation, okay? And as it turned out, as it turned out, members of the pro-Confederate, if you will, city militia were drilling that morning. They were parading in Baltimore, and then word arrived that trainloads of Northern volunteers were heading their way. They were determined to resist. So they organized and they gathered together, okay? And they were determined not to allow these Pennsylvanians to march through their city to respond to Abraham Lincoln's call. So several thousand of them began to gather. And as the Pennsylvanians, meanwhile, blissfully unaware, on those trains, making their way south, then a telegram arrives and the captains of those five companies received word that a mob was forming to contest their arrival. They decided, well, we're gonna go through anyway. But, just to be safe, we're gonna get off the trains a little bit north of Bolton Station. That'll do it. <laughs> That'll do it. So at one o'clock that afternoon, after one o'clock, the trains carrying these Pennsylvania volunteers stopped just short of Bolton Station. But the mob quickly caught on to that ruse. They rushed their way north to where the Pennsylvanians were just then stepping off the train. And Captain Wren of the Washington Artillery, he wrote that the mob approached, quote, like a lot of angry wolves. They began jeering and taunting and cursing at these Pennsylvanians. It's no longer a picnic, is it? No longer an agreeable visit to the Capitol. There were shouts supporting Jeff Davis. There were insults against Lincoln and the Union. And it was impossible, impossible in the midst of that for these company commanders to organize and get their guys in column, in formation, to march to the next train station, okay? They had to march to Camden Station to pick up the B&O Railroad to Washington, okay? So they had about a two-mile journey to get from north of Bolton Station to Camden Station, okay? So they all got back on the cars. They all got back on, and this mob is there still yelling, cursing. So let's call the Baltimore City Police. Here they come. The Baltimore mayor is there, George Brown, and the police marshal, George Kane. They have arrived. The entire Baltimore City Police Force has arrived. They are now going to escort these Pennsylvanians through the city. But this was cold comfort. As many of these first defenders said, a lot of these police officers were laughing at them. They were enjoying their discomfort, their anxiety, because many of the police officers fully agreed with the sympathies of that gathering mob, okay? So they finally got off the trains and they began their march through the city. Abolitionists, 
Stone them, kill them. Hurrah for Jeff Davis, you'll never get out of here alive. Have you your coffins made? These were some of the things the Pennsylvanians heard as they marched to ba through Baltimore heading toward Camden Station. And halfway along the way, Major Pemberton and that contingent of 40 regulars peeled away from the column to make their way toward Fort McHenry. So now these Pennsylvanians are more vulnerable. Yes, the police are there on either side of them, trying their best to hold back this mob, trying to keep everything in order. But as James Wren wrote, Major Pemberton paid no attention to the troops and took no interest in the march. On the way to Baltimore, he handed over his command to his orderly sergeant, who was to take the regulars to Fort McHenry. Pemberton went right through to Washington and resigned, afterwards joining the rebel army. So the departure of these regulars, it breathed new life, new daring into the mob. They were emboldened. The insults grew louder and more vehement, and the police was having an increasingly difficult time maintaining order. These Pennsylvanians are outnumbered nearly five to one. About 2,500 in that mob, about 500 of these Pennsylvanians. The historian of the Allen Infantry wrote it this way. The mob, on seeing the formation of the column and the march begun, were driven into a frenzy. At every step, its numbers increased, and when Pemberton and his regulars left the head of the column, the mob lashed itself into a perfect fury. Roughs and toughs, longshoremen, gamblers, floaters, idlers, red-hot secessionists, as well as ordinarily sober and steady men, crowded upon, pushed, and hustled the little band and made every effort to break the thin line. It was a severe trial for the volunteers with not a charge of ball or powder in their pouches. For these Pennsylvanians, it must have seemed an eternity, an eternity, but finally, they arrived at Camden Station. At last, the B&O Railroad are waiting for them to take them on the rest of their journey to the Capitol, but it was there at Camden Station where violence at last broke out. As the column ground to a halt, as the Pennsylvanians began to board the train cards of the B&O, that's when bottles and bricks and stones and clubs and whatever else the mob could get a hold of began to rain down and crash among these volunteers. The Allen infantry was at the rear of the column. Most of the injuries was within that unit, okay? David Jacobs, he got hit in the face with a, with a brick. He lost a number of teeth. He also broke his wrist when he fell. Jacob J David Jacobs in the middle there. Wilson Durr, temporarily lost his hearing when he was struck in the head with another brick. Edwin Hinkle and Ignaz Kresser were each left limping when they were hit in the ankles. But the first hit, the first one to be struck down, or so many believed, was Nick Biddle. Apparently, it was the sight of Biddle, a black man in uniform that especially infuriated this mob swearing and cursing at Biddle, an unknown assailant grabbed a brick, launched it at him, and hit him squarely in the face. Squarely in the face. He fell backward, but he was caught by an officer from another one of those militia companies, and staggering, he helped him onto one of these train cars. Nick Biddle was taken care of, he was cared for by the members of that company as they finally finally got on board that train. He got some treatment. His head was wrapped in bandages, which quickly bled through, but it was amidst this shower of bottles and stones and bricks that the Pennsylvanians hurried on board. And inside one of the train cars, one of the Pennsylvanians discovered that the floor had been sprinkled with powder. The thought is if they light up a match on a pipe or a cigar, it would blow he and his comrades, he said, to perdition. Some others of the mob, they attempted to detach the engine of the train, but this effort, said one man, was prevented by the determined character of the engineer after they drew revolvers and threatened to shoot any man who made that attempt. At last, at long last, among the demonic yells of this mob, and as the sides of these train cars are continuing to be pelted with stones and bottles and bricks, the train cars began to pull away from Baltimore. They got out alive. And the next day, they realized how fortunate they had been 
when they heard what happened to the 6th Massachusetts, who was following in their footsteps on April 19th. In letters home in the days and weeks that followed, the Pennsylvanians did their best to describe the ordeal, said Captain Thomas Yeager, we have just escaped with our lives. Oh, it was awful. Right and left of us, there are fists on our noses. You have no idea of the language, the conduct, the danger. Curtis Pollock of the Washington Artillery, he said, we were hissed and hooted at and called all manner of hard names and the people were hurrahing for Jeff Davis and the Southern Confederacy. It would have taken very little, he said, to raise a row, but we had no arms and we did not say anything to them. Nick Biddle had his head cut open to the bone with a stone thrown by one of the secesh. And of course, naturally, many of those Pennsylvanians wanted revenge. Just give us a chance to square the account, right? Said Edgar Richards. He said, what a circus it would be for our boys to be allowed to square our little account with the people of Baltimore. The boys swear if we had the chance, we would blow up the whole place and turn it into a farm. <coughs> April 18th evening, at last. What a day. They were up early, but now finally that evening, the trains arrive at the B&O station at the foot of Capitol Hill. And there, ready to greet them, in the darkness, in the dusk of that April evening, was Major Irvin McDowell. Okay, he would go on. He was a first bull run infamy, if you will. But Major Irvin McDowell was the regular Army officer in charge of the defenses of the U.S. Capitol building. And that's where these Pennsylvanians were headed. They are heading to the United States Capitol building to defend it, to protect it. And it was a trying day. They, there were men who were bruised and battered and bloodied, none more so perhaps than Nick Biddle when they arrived in Washington. But nevertheless, said one man, we arrived in fine spirits because we were the very first company that are here. Marching up the steps and into the Capitol building, the volunteers let out three cheers that they had arrived. And they soon began to spread rumors. Hey, we may only be 500, but you know what? I mean 5,000, uh, 5,500. In fact, there's 2,000 more behind us. Because Washington, <laughs> like Baltimore, had a lot of folks who were supportive of the Confederacy, okay? So late that night, a correspondent for the Washington Evening Star. He paid a visit to the Capitol building and he reported on the arrival of these Pennsylvania soldiers. He said, two of the Pennsylvania companies we found quartered in the luxurious committee rooms of the Northern Wing. The newly arrived soldiers had Brussels carpets, marble washstands, and all that sort of thing, but seemed to think they should prefer to all of this a bite to eat, as they have had nothing since an early hasty breakfast in Harrisburg, they had suffered too miserably from thirst on the way. And at one station where they stopped, they were glad to quench their thirst with a pool of muddy water. This, with the hostile reception received at Baltimore, gave them a pretty rude taste of soldiers' life. But they are all in good spirits, except for the failure of the commissary at their quarters. So yeah, they're starving, okay? After a day like that, they arrive, they're hungry, and in addition to the newspaper reporters that come to, to get, a, get a gauge of these Pennsylvanians to report on their arrival, politicians began to show up too. Speaker of the House, Galusha Groh was there. Simon Cameron, Secretary of War, he wrote later, of all the days of my life, this is the happiest. To know that Pennsylvania troops were the first to reach the Capitol. So said Simon Cameron. Now for the day laborers and the clerks and the coal miners and the students who composed the ranks of these companies, what a day. Quite the 24 hours, April 18th, right? Here they were, now quartered in the committee rooms and the offices of the U.S. Capitol building. They're being met by these politicians, quite a memorable day, but perhaps the next day, the next day was equally as memorable. Because on April 19th, they are also visited by Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln arrived at the Capitol to meet and to personally thank these Pennsylvanians for their timely arrival. Remember that anxiety that pervaded the Capitol. Who's going to get there first? Will the Capitol be attacked? Well, now 
Now the first volunteers to respond to his call are there. He made his way along with Seward and Cameron, two of his cabinet secretaries, and he shook the hands of these Pennsylvania volunteers. One of the members of the Washington Artillery yelled out, speech, speech. They wanted to hear a speech from Lincoln. Officers and soldiers of the Washington Artillery, he said, I did not come here to make a speech. The time for speech making has gone by. The time for action is at hand. I came here to give you a warm welcome to the city of Washington and to shake hands with every officer and soldier in your company, provided you grant me that privilege. Company by company, they lined up, they shook the hands of the commander in chief, and Heber Thompson of the Washington Artillery later said, this visit of President Lincoln and his secretaries most forcibly expressed the relief which the presence of the first defenders afforded as well as the generous purpose of Lincoln and his cabinet to honor those who first responded to their call for volunteers. Oliver Bosby Shell, you can see him seated there in that photograph, he left this account. Imagine the scene. Here were sturdy young fellows suddenly called upon to don the uniform of soldiers many of whom had never been out of sight of the mountains of their state, spread out upon the hard marble floors of the Capitol in an effort to secure some rest from the fatiguing journey when every man is brought to his feet by the announcement of the presence of the one man in the United States each of us most desire to see, the honored chieftain of the nation, Abraham Lincoln. Profound silence for a moment broken by the hand clapping and cheers of the tired volunteers. Yes, here, towering over all in the room was the great central figure of the war. I remember how impressed I was by the kindliness of his face and the awkward hanging of his arms and legs, his apparent bashfulness in the presence of these first soldiers of the Republic, and with it all a grave, rather mournful bearing in his attitude accompanying him, his guide, his guide, our own great citizen, Simon Cameron. He was highly elated and proud to introduce Mr. Lincoln to the soldier boys of his own commonwealth. The president's words were few, but earnest and impressive. A kind of awe seemed to come over the boys, and many for the first time realized the peril brought on by the nation. Did I lose my mic? Can you still hear me okay? <laughs> okay. Close contact with the man at the helm was more than the satisfaction of personal curiosity. It was a kind of baptism of responsibilities, heretofore unheeded, a revelation of a state of profound seriousness in the solving of which each one listening to the great leader's words felt personally called upon to his best. That's what Oliver Bosby Shell said. Curtis Pollock, who we see behind him, he said Lincoln was very tall, but not at all bad looking. That's how he remembered it. <laughs> you know, making his way from company to company, Abraham Lincoln heard of what happened in Baltimore. And he saw the injuries to some of these soldiers. And presumably, he came face to face with Nick Biddle. And imagine that moment. Here was Abraham Lincoln, face to face with Nick Biddle, his head covered in blood-soaked bandages, his blood dripping on the floor of the U.S. Capitol building, a man who may have been born enslaved and escaped and now is back in uniform. What a moment. I would love to see that on canvas. Any screenwriters watching make a compelling movie, right? This visit from Abraham Lincoln this was a highlight of the first defenders' 90 days of service, for they spent the entirety of their three months in and around Washington. They never got to fire their musket in anger. They never met the enemy upon the field of battle, but they guarded the Capitol building. They piled up hundreds of barrels of flour inside the walls or the hallways of this building. They pulled heavy pieces of iron to protect the fronts and the sides of the stairs leading into this building. But there they remained in Washington for those 90 days. 
as more and more units began to arrive, the 6th Massachusetts, the 7th New York, the 8th Massachusetts, as more volunteers began to arrive, well, they thought the capital doesn't need protecting. All right, let's move these people out. So many of the first defenders went to Fort Washington, several miles south of the city along the Potomac River. Others went to the Washington Arsenal. And there they paraded, and there they drilled, and they, there, there they were inspected. Officer schools were established, but there's no active campaigning. Their active campaign was the journey to Washington. As a quick aside, Fort Washington, National Park site, impressive place if you've never been there. In 1896, 35 years after this momentous day, the veteran first defenders retraced their route to Washington. They gathered in Harrisburg. They marched through Baltimore, where they were greeted with a receptive crowd. And they made their way to Fort Washington. And one of these first defenders proudly showed where he had carved his name into a stone. There is Francis Bannon in 1896. He wants you to see his hat, first defenders. And that's his name that he carved right there. And guess what? It's still there. <laughs> you can still see it. Just barely. Francis Bannon, there it is. Now, this is where they spent their 90 days of service. By late July, 1861, 90 days have come and gone. Their term of service has expired. And by the end of July, these volunteers are now back home in Lewistown and Redding and Pottsville and Allentown, and they were greeted home as heroes. Allentown declared July 27th a holiday in order to welcome back the Allen infantry. Stores, factories, workshops were all closed down. Crowds lined the streets, applauding and waving handkerchiefs to the returning soldiers. And by the way, that's a photograph of the Ringgold Light Artillery at the Washington Navy Yard. They were there for about two days, just enough time to get that photo taken. <laughs> but by the end of July, they're back home. And Private William McKay of the Logan, Logan Guards, he said, the people of Lewistown, the entire population turned out to receive us, and we received a perfect ovation. The citizens received us with all the honors. A bounteous, never-to-be-forgotten dinner was provided to us, and speeches of welcome were made and responded to. More honor would arrive on July 22nd, one day after the debacle at First Bull Run. By the way, none of these first defenders was engaged in that battle. But on July 22nd, Speaker of the House Galusha Grow introduced a resolution to bestow the thanks of Congress on these first defenders. The 37th Congress resolved that the thanks of this House are due and are hereby tendered to the 530 soldiers from Pennsylvania who passed through the mob at Baltimore and reached Washington on the 18th of April for the defense of the national capital. So they got the thanks of Congress for their prompt arrival. They were naturally glad to be back home, but for most of them, it was a short, short, visit, because the war is still going on. The war has only gotten started. And each of these communities engaged in recruiting and organizing and looking for volunteers, most of them would re-enlist. Most of the soldiers of the first defenders would go on to fight in three-year regiments or nine-month units, like the 46th, the 47th, the 48th, the 96th, the 128th Pennsylvania, the 7th Pennsylvania Cavalry, the ranks of those regiments are filled with first defenders. Heber Thompson would say, hardly a single great battle was fought in the four years of the war, from Second Bull Run, Antietam, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, Wilderness in the east, and from Shiloh, Murfreesboro, uh, Chickamauga in the west in which the first defenders were not represented. Their individual war records would fill volumes of history. Throughout the next four years, many, many of those first defenders would give their lives 
serving in these other units, including Thomas Yeager, the commander of the Allen Infantry, killed at Fair Oaks, Lewis Martin, killed as major at South Mountain, Thomas Hullings, killed as colonel at Spotsylvania, Kurt Pollock, who remembered seeing Lincoln, killed at Petersburg. And I say that because major, lieutenant, colonel, most of these first defenders, when they re-enlisted, would do so as commissioned officers in these other units, drawing upon the experience they had in those first 90 days. Not pictured here is Sergeant Frederick Hart of the Logan Guards, killed in action July 1st, 1863 at Gettysburg. Many others would go on to great acclaim. William Alman would stay in the army, rising to the rank of U.S. or general, fighting alongside Theodore Roosevelt in 1899. He's buried today at Arlington National Cemetery. Ignaz Gresser, who got hit in the ankle <laughs> with a brick, is a Medal of Honor recipient for heroics at Antietam. Henry Cake would go on to serve in Congress. Henry Hill, Medal of Honor recipient, and William Mitchell, Logan Guards, aide de camp to Winfield Scott Hancock. So he was there with Hancock throughout the entirety of the war, including here on Cemetery Hill and Cemetery Ridge as his aide de camp. And now is the time for you to discover what happened to your soldier. So if you have your envelopes, give them an open and see whether or not they made it home. Every single one of these soldiers re-enlisted. So even though they may not have had much to write home about during their first 90 days, they would serve with the 7th Cavalry, the 96th PA. How many of your soldiers made it back home? How many did not? That's a good number. Yep, so I encourage you to keep those, take them home, look more into their lives. And that including all of you at home still watching, <laughs> If you're able to find a soldier, discover his story. Now, for those first defenders, for those first defenders who did make it back home after the war, yes, yes, they were proud of their service with these other units, but they were especially proud to be members of the first defenders. This meant a lot to them. They had annual reunions, the first defenders associations. They would meet annually. Here they are in Reading, Pennsylvania. Here they are in Allentown. And by the way, there's Francis Bannon right there who carved his name on that stone. <laughs> so there they are. They met regularly, year after year after year. And yes, they want you to know that they were first defenders. <laughs> Look at our hats. <laughs> they met annually, and they got ribbons and medals. Oliver Bosby Shell, who left that account of meeting Lincoln, well, he went on to work for the US Mint in Philadelphia. <clears throat> so <laughs> we have a connection, don't we? In the 1890s, the state of Pennsylvania paid for first defender medals to be given to each of the first defenders or their families. And what's unique about these, they're all individually engraved. So there were only, I believe, 530 of these medals struck, each one with a first defender's name and company. These were also minted and given out to the first defenders. Washington, April 18, 1861. But they're not personalized like this one here. But still, those were some of the medals that they wore after the war at those reunions. Ribbons! <laughs> Each of the reunions, they had ribbons. Interestingly, here, a photo of Biddle, first man to shed blood in the rebellion, 1861 to 1865. <clears throat> The last of the first defenders was Francis Stitzer. Anyone here have the envelope of Frank Stitzer? No? Well, Frank Stitzer was painting a house in Pottsville. There he is, over here. 
He was painting a house in Pottsville, apparently, when the call of Lincoln arrived, dropped his brush, went off to fight with the Washington artillery. He later served as Captain Company K of the 48th Pennsylvania, traveled out west. He became the Adjutant General of Wyoming and the two-term mayor of Laramie. Here he is in 1938 at Gettysburg, even though he wasn't here during the Battle of Gettysburg. <laughs> Still, newspaper headline, first defender's sole survivor is 99 today. He wanted to make it to 100. He was about two months shy. When he passed away in 1939, he was the last, the last of the first defenders. Now, despite their place in history, it wasn't long before they kind of got pushed to the footnotes. But in their home communities, they were never forgotten. In Allentown, there is the memorial to the Allen Infantry, West Penn Park, the First Defenders Memorial, to commemorate the patriotism and courage of the officers and men of the Allen Infantry. That's a pretty striking statue there. Redding has a monument to the Ringgold Light Artillery, James McKnight's company, to commemorate the patriotism and promptitude of the Ringgold Light Artillery, one of the first defenders. By the way, the Ringgold Light Artillery, more than any other company, wanted the distinction of being the first of the first of the first. <laughs> they were the first in Harrisburg. They were the first to get off the train in Baltimore. They were the first to get off the train in Washington. In Lewistown, a more recent memorial has been placed on the side of this building telling you the story of the Logan Guards, right there. I'd like to go see that. So my wife and daughter, I guess we got a road trip coming up. <laughs> no, you're looking forward to it. <laughs> and finally in Pottsville, the monument on the left is the Schuylkill County Soldiers Monument. In 1951, they added this plaque to it, to the memory of the first defenders and Nicholas Biddle of Pottsville, first man to shed blood in the Civil War. There is even, there is even today, a plaque to the first defenders inside the US Capitol building. You can see right here, the Logan Guards, the Washington Artillery, National Light Infantry, Allen Infantry, Ringgold Light Artillery, right here. I wonder what they would think to know that the 6th Massachusetts <laughs> is up top. <laughs> Still, it's the thought that counts, right? <laughs> now, to conclude, <clears throat> to conclude, I want to return to Nick Biddle. <clears throat> Nick Biddle returned to Pottsville when the Washington Artillery arrived home in late July of 1861. He was never paid as a soldier, because he never officially was a soldier. He never took the oath of allegiance, because he couldn't. He would never receive a pension, even though he was injured very badly. In 1863, he saw, uh, sat for this image, this very compelling image. November 1863, as Lincoln is traveling toward Gettysburg, Nick Biddle made his way to Mortimer Studio in Pottsville, and he donned that uniform that he wore going through Baltimore, and he sat for that image. And many believe that this, and that, and this are the bloodstains. Many believe that this is the hat he wore tucked under his sleeve, but perhaps, perhaps it was that blood-soaked bandage that he wore around his head. A rather striking image. He sold copies of that photograph at the Great Central Fair in 1864. He arrived there as a celebrity almost, people wanting to meet the first man to shed blood in the war. And he sold copies of that carte de visite, that CDV image of himself. According to James Guthrie, who wrote about Nick Biddle in 1899. James Guthrie was a Union veteran. He became a Baptist minister, went to Pottsville. He became the chaplain of the local veterans group in Pottsville. And he wrote of Biddle 
Biddle to his dying day, never tired of talking about those supreme hours of his life, the time of his wounding and the time of Lincoln's call to see him and sympathize with him, and the scar which he carried to his grave. You can see it in that image. He proudly showed to people interested. It was his badge and his brand of patriotism. He sat for another portrait later in life. You can see that one on your right. But what they both have in common, the first man wounded in the great American rebellion. He achieved another first in 1870. Following the ratification of the 15th Amendment, Nicholas Nick Biddle became the first African American to vote in Pottsville, Pennsylvania. Sadly, though, he died broke. He was destitute. He had nothing. His final years, he worked until he no longer could. During his final years, he would be seen walking around Pottsville asking for money. Nick Biddle died on August 2nd, 1876, and news of his death was printed, believe it or not, across the country. From New York to San Francisco, to Ma from Maine to Louisiana, even two newspapers I found in England printed notice of Nick Biddle's death. Nick Biddle, a colored man who marched with the Pottsville White Infantry, wrong, <laughs> and on whom the first blood was drawn, died a few weeks ago. Nick Biddle died, hit by a brick bat, a wound in the cheek. This one here captured the sentiment of most, though. He died in obscurity because he was only a colored servant. How Nick Biddle was remembered and forgotten still in his life. But he would never be forgotten by the Washington artillery. It was the Washington artillery who paid for his funeral. They buried Nick Biddle in the Bethel AME Cemetery, a military burial. They fired a salute over his grave. And whenever they met, the first defenders told the story of Nick Biddle. Remember that ribbon with his picture on it? In 1896, when they retraced their route to Washington, they met President Grover Cleveland in the White House, and they gave him a framed portrait of Nick Biddle, the first man to shed blood in the war. The first defenders also also paid for a headstone to be placed over Nick Biddle's grave. It read, in memory of Nicholas Biddle, died August 2nd, 1876, aged 80 years. His was the proud distinction of shedding the first blood in the late war for the Union, being wounded while marching through Baltimore with the first volunteers from Schuylkill County, 18 April, 1861, erected by his friends in Pottsville. Now that stone, as you can see, <laughs> by the 1950s crumbled apart. It was replaced in 1976, bicentennial year, 100 years after his death, with that stone that continues to stand at his grave. Now, I have been there countless times, but I still visit whenever I can. And by the way, Nick Biddle, as far as I know, never sat for an interview. He never left a written account. But how did he commemorate his place in history? Those photographs. Those photographs were his way of documenting his place in history. Now, Nick Biddle was not the first person to shed blood in the Civil War. I'll say it. <laughs> it was a 33-hour bombardment at Fort Sumter. There were thousands upon thousands of artillery rounds. And even if we accept that no one was killed during the bombardment, surely the masonry, the iron, drew some blood. We don't know who shed the first blood in the Civil War. But perhaps a case can be made that Nicholas Biddle was the first African American to shed blood in uniform. And that is a proud distinction indeed. And when I head to that cemetery and I see that grave, I can't help but think of a poem that was written by James Guthrie, that chaplain who I mentioned earlier, because he stood at that grave. And in 1890, he wrote the following. 
the grave of Nick Biddle. The grave of Nick Biddle, a Mecca, should be to pilgrims who seek in the land of the free, the tombs of the lowly as well as the great, who struggled for freedom in war or debate. For there lies a, ma a man, a brave man, distinguished from all, in that his veins furnished the first blood to fall. In war for the Union, when traitors assailed, it's brave first defenders whose hearts never quailed. A little bit later on in the poem, and I'll conclude with his final two stanzas, he said, how strange too it seems that the Capitol floor where slaveholders sat in the Congress of yore and forged for his kindred chains heavy to bear to bind down the black man in endless despair should be stained with his blood and thus sanctified, made sacred to freedom through time to abide, a temple of justice with every right for all the nation, black, red man, and white. The grave of Nick Biddle, though humble it be, is nobler by far in the sight of the free than tombs of those chieftains whose sinful crusade brought long wars of mourning and countless graves made in striving to fetter their black fellow men and make of the Southland a vast prison pen. Their cause was unholy, but Biddle's was just, and hosts of pure spirits watch over his dust. Before you leave, and I'm gonna ask my daughter and niece to help me out here. So we continue to remember in Biddle, we have little fake CDVs for you. So make sure you grab one on your way out. They will meet you at the front door up top. But with that being said, did I go over my time? Oh, I apologize. <laughs> I am so sorry. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming out today. Thank you.